Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back. Welcome to Talking Bollocks. I I am your host, Howard H. Smith. As I am all the time. I was going to say every month, but these uh, these are these are coming at you more regularly than once a month now. I'm trying to get uh, quite a few out there to you. Movie Bollocks is out at the moment. Um, even though I say so myself, a great interview with a friend of mine, Phil Jackson, who has been in all sorts from... from um, Poirot to uh, Mike Bassett, England manager, and on all sorts of other things in between, a couple of Mike Lee movies, so check that out if it's in your podcast player and you haven't been bothered to download it yet, but I haven't done the intro, intro, I haven't done the intro, my name is Howard Smith, I, Howard H. Smith I suppose, I do this podcast, I do, as you are well aware, um, I'm also singer in UK thrash band Acid Rain, first album for 29 years, came out 11 months ago, bloody hell was it really that long? Um, and obviously unable to tour it. I also do stand-up comedy, unable to do that at the moment as well. I also am a quiz master, unable to do that at the moment. Uh, so, yeah, basically, uh, plenty of time for me to be doing this. And, to that end, what has been happening in the world of metal since we last spoke? Well, um, not a lot because um, shows are pretty much still not happening. Um, I got an email this morning which says, by the way, there might be a little bit more back background noise than usual, and that's because I've got my balcony door open slightly because it is too fucking hot to be able to do this with the door shut. Sorry, but it's just not happening. I'd sweat my little breasts off. Um, so anyway, yeah, what? Well, not a great deal. Um, so anyway, yeah, I got an email um, uh, telling me that Biffy Clyro are playing an intimate show in April 2021 at the Forum in London. Well, firstly, I mean, you've got to be a pretty big bag, b- bag band. Obviously, they are because the Forum is not an intimate show. It holds two thousand people. So if you if you call that intimate, your band is obviously quite big. Secondly, um, is it going to be intimate? Are we all going to be crammed in there together? Mm, at the moment? Yeah, I'm saying no. Um, but one thing I have to say, one thing I have to say, is that this date is on Biffy Clyro's tour, and it is called the Fingers Crossed Tour. So, you know, fair enough. Fair fucking fucks to them. Yeah, they are They are clearly acknowledging the fact that, do you know what, guys? This might not happen. And that show is in April 2021. If you have tickets for shows in 2020, just bear in mind that you may, may well not be getting these scanned at a venue. I'm still blown away that artists were actually announcing tours this year. Really am. I'm looking at you pretty much everybody who um announced dates um unbelievable some little festivals you know who've decided that oh yeah we're going ahead and i can think of one in particular right which is going ahead in the months before december okay they've announced it i would love to ask the organizer how many tickets are you selling because i know for a fact that they won't be able to answer that because their event at the moment is illegal. Well, not illegal, it's just it's not allowed. So by the time the end of the year comes round, there will, you know, if, if these shows are allowed, then there will be specific restrictions, and those restrictions will include what social distancing is meant to be done and everything else, but also how many tickets you can sell. Because at the moment, this festival that goes across two days is selling tickets and doesn't know how many people it'll be allowed it'll, it will be allowed to let in the venues in the venue should it go ahead so if it comes around they could well end up having to uh, somehow decide who gets in and who doesn't refund x amount of tickets or not or just fucking call it off and do it next year but some people genuinely believe that their own enthusiasm and positivity can drive away a pandemic now that's fine that's absolutely fine in being positive and if you really want to set up your festivals and things like that for before the end of the year despite the fact that in the same month your festival is we've had uh, two festivals already cancelled fine do that 
You set it up. You be positive. It gives us all something to look forward to, doesn't it? Come on. Let's, you know, it'll go. But when it doesn't, what then, my friend? Hmm? Let's be positive. Oh, you know, it'll happen. Come on. Let's. Oh, we, no, we're not allowed. That's right. So, I don't know. I, I, I'm not kind of sure what the point is here, by the way. Um, but all I'm saying is that, yeah. I don't think anything's happening this year. But then again, what the fuck do I know? I mean, why am I setting myself up as some sort of authority? I'm not, by the way. I'm not. This is just genuinely what I think. Yeah, what 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 I think. And we've spoken to our promoters. We've spoken to our agent. We spoke to our management. We spoke to the label. We've all talked amongst ourselves um, and 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 come up with a way of dealing with all of this, which is what we're doing. Which is obviously you know rescheduled everything until September October um, next year. And again. Pfft, Fingers crossed. Um, the the further we get out of lockdown, the more I keep hearing this phrase that, well, this is the way it is now. And, well, y- you know, things still aren't getting back to normal. And I did hear for the first time since probably lockdown first came or it was being spoken about was an expert basically saying, look, until there is a vaccine, we will not be returning to the way things were. Full stop. So no, you won't be crammed into venues and things like that. And this wasn't a guy speaking about the music business or anything like that. Just a, a an expert on, you know, uh, um, not pandemics, but on, on viruses and stuff like that. And he was just like, look, you're going to have to get used to the idea that we are not going back to, pro, to pre-corona until there is no more corona. So I don't know. Maybe it'll just fuck off on its own. You know, I mean, apparently that's... Uh, that's an option according to some insane politicians. Anyway, fucking hell, let's not go down that particular fucking rabbit hole, shall I? Anyway, right, okay, so what's been happening in the month of metal, uh, or at least since we last spoke? Well, this is what's currently amazing me about metal, okay? First up, here we are. This is page one as I speak on Blabbermouth, and I'm going to read out the artists who they are running stories on. First story, top of the page, here we go. Uh, D. Schneider. Next story, Winger. Next, Dokken. Next, Five Indica Death Punch. Next, Kiss. Next, Ozzy. Next, Chris Slade of ACDC. Next, Motley Crue. Next, Accept. Next, Charvo from System of, System of Down. Next, Striper. Next, Armoured Saint. Next, Cory Taylor. Next, Metallica. After that, Metallica again. After that, Evanescence. After that, Ted Nugent. After that, Lita Ford. Now, I don't know if any of you listening to this are seeing where I'm going, but Jesus fucking Christ. Is this a time warp? Have we just suddenly gone back 20 years? Well, what the fuck? It's literally just lists, lists of bands who are, who have seen better days, let's be honest. And look, I don't mean, I don't mean to, um, to to slag off anybody. I really don't. My my point isn't, is not about any of the artist names or anything like like that. But my point is, bloody hell, it's a slow news cycle right now. Uh, And what you're getting is it's no different to mainstream media. The metal media is really struggling. And it would appear that the only people who are willing to throw quotes out there um, these days for, for, you know, people to be able to uh, run stories on, well, it would appear that um, D is doing his best. Um, uh, Michael Sweet of Striper is doing his best. And um, and all, all the the aforementioned artists are doing their best to uh, to stay well, not to stay in the news, but to give to give metal sites something to actually write about. Um, it's just bizarre. I couldn't believe it when I opened it up. I was just like, right, okay. Um, what else been going on? I don't know about anyone else, but I am I'm I'm pretty much sick now of the lockdown version of this song the lockdown version of that song the group of fucking 
tons of um musicians who you wouldn't expect to get together to get together playing a song you wouldn't expect them to be covering but they are and it's like yeah okay right i look i'm bored as well we're all bored but i'm bored of this as well now so yeah can we just stop i'm by the, i haven't seen one that i've watched watched more than once and watched them again like yeah okay fine yeah i've, I've kind of seen that now so not not really interested anymore um and speaking speaking of that uh next story up that i wanted to talk about was um down down are celebrating the 25th anniversary of nola with full length exclusive live stream on august the 29th okay so um here we go there were plans for performing um that which were sidelined due to the corona pandemic well what a surprise there but instead what we're getting is um, the Quarter Century Throwdown, a high octane production multi camera event, will take place on August the 29th at 6 pm EST using cutting edge streaming technology to create a one of a kind virtual ex- concert experience. The show will be re broadcast October the 30th. Comments the band Down was simply a band started by friends with the love of heavy music and all, uh, and the songs of the Nola album were magic from the first rehearsal. We'd be extremely grateful to be celebrating the Nola record with a live stream the world can see. Watch the show uh, and plug in through your loudest stereo. We love you all. I must admit, I do remember that album. I did get, I did get the album, and it was, uh, and, well, it was and still is, a very good album. I just, not, again, down when it seemed to go down the COC route, which is were really cool sort of cross, crossover, then a bit more metal and very cool, and then sludgy, mid-paced, southern drawl, whiskey-soaked, grunge no not grunge sludge more than anything else i just yeah really become something so yeah down unfortunately for me anyway for me just me um yeah went the way of coc and just all became a bit sort of southern southern united states drawl metal hey there y'all i'm gonna play you some metal i do apologize to anybody in the southern united states who um I had to listen to that. That must have been uh, like having sandpaper ground into your ears. So, what else is going on? Um, as we, as mentioned previously, not a lot. Um, I mean, I know my situation is is pretty fucked. Um, so, I, and and you know, I'm not in any way um, kind of you know going around with a begging bowl here or anything like that because I know we're all suffering. So, um, everybody is is in a position that they would really rather not be in i absolutely get that um yeah my situation is pretty fucked as well not a great deal um going well obviously band no comedy no as i listed up at the beginning um what's strange about lockdown is we're coming out here in um in the uk we've been coming out of lockdown for a while and more and more is happening um and the weird thing about all of that is is actually making me feel even more isolated because as people come out of lockdown and are able to start doing things again, I realise that actually my life hasn't really changed. Um, I mean, I'm usually out performing three or four nights a week, um, not down the pub with mates three or four nights a week, not, not that any of you are either. But what it means is that the way my life has sort of developed over time, um, I'm not blaming anyone for this, this isn't ab- absolutely you know what I've done. Um, but I don't, I don't see much. I don't see much of my friends. My friends don't live that locally. I'm, I'm basically, I'm, I'm the guy who's always busy, um, and I'm not because I can't do any of my stuff. And not being able to do any of my stuff, literally, when I'm performing, that's me going out. That's me socialising as well as working. It's that, that's my socialising. Um, and so if I'm not working, I'm not socialising. I am very much isolated. Uh, I've lived on my own for over a decade. Um, I know, frightening, right? I, where, the, where the fuck did that happen? Um, and um, it can do your fucking head in because my life, basically, we're coming out of lockdown, but I, nothing's changed for me apart from I can go out the house more. But my actual life, my actual routine, what I am doing has not changed one iota since we were in the midst of lockdown because nothing that I do has come back um, I do a little bit of business development as well and one of those projects has come back but that is taking a kicking at the moment and is certainly not going to do the figures it did last year so again there, there'll be payment for that but it will come in um, it will come in at less so it, it's 
it's kind of making me think as well right okay you need to have a look at your life here and and what the fuck man <laughs> you know um make more of an effort to um to hook up with friends and and all the rest of it although it's i don't exactly want to be um doing a lot of traveling and hanging around a load of pubs right now but having said that um maybe you know that's not necessarily the only option but without a doubt um i'm definitely feeling locked down more now we're coming out of it than than we were i guess it's as well a bit of isolation a bit of loneliness and and all of that does play into doing your fucking head in and um and and i'm sure there's some of you there nodding along to this who completely and totally understand and get that and are in a similar position and i'm sure there's people out there um who are who who are you know who have families kids running around all over the time and thinking god i wouldn't mind a bit of peace and quiet myself <laughs> we're all you know we're, we're, we've all got our own things to deal with is what i'm saying and, and and this unprecedented event just doesn't really help i mean neither do the conspiracy theorists either please go fuck yourselves and 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 if you have a conspiracy theory just remember this just remember this conspiracy theories are how idiots feel intellectual yeah that's right you ignore all of the facts and evidence and everything else and you instead you latch on to a seven minute youtube clip produced by somebody who has no qualifications in the subject that they are talking about but hey go for your life anyway um <laughs> kind of tangenty there but i wanted to be i wanted to be honest and i can't sit here and shout and scream down the mic and be mr hilarious um if i'm not feeling it and and at the moment it's you know things are tough and i'm just uh, you know i wonder whether to record this or not right now um but i decided to go for it anyway and um and and like i said i'm i'm not complaining i'm moaning and we've all got shit to deal with it's just a kind of way of me i suppose talking to somebody about it um so my apologies you are officially my counselors um but you, you know we, we all have to talk about we all have to talk about our feelings and, and and especially when it comes to mental health and stuff like that um and i'll also be honest with you i've had to come off my adhd medication um because of side effects um so i normally walk around at about between 10 and 10 and a half stone at the moment i am nine stone um i have been um I, I, yeah i've been making new notches on my watch yeah that's how you know when you've lost weight um which is a side effect of the meds and some other bits and pieces as well but unfortunately it now means that i've got to i've got to be um uh, referred back to them and that's gonna and that's gonna take a while but anyway you know my problems shut the fuck up howard stop moaning stop whinging and i'm trying not to i promise if after all of that you feel like signing up at patreon <laughs> so you can listen to me moan some more um, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Howard H. Smith. Five dollars a month gets you uh, your own podcast. This podcast early, you get to ask que you get to ask guest questions. Uh, you also get loads of acid rain behind the scenes stuff. Uh, you get all the stuff that everyone sees, but you get it much earlier. But you also get stuff that nobody will ever see, etc., etc. There is coming up to three hundred posts that you can download behind the paywall. Why not sign up for one month, five dollars? Download as much as you can eat uh, and fuck off again. That's fine with me, not a problem. But anyway, guys, it would be lovely to have you to join in now. This. This episode, this episode's interview is with somebody who was one of the first people that I met in the proper music industry, proper itself, okay? Legendary rock and metal photographer, um, Tony Mottram. Absolute ledge. Um, great guy. Has you ha As kids, you had posters of pictures that he'd taken on your walls. Just look it up, Tony Mottram, photographer. In fact, I think um, it's a while since I did this interview, but at the top you will, it, Tony does talk about his website and you'll know, you'll be able to go to all of his sites, see all of his pics, they are fucking amazing. This guy was at the, t at the absolute peak of his powers when the industry was at the peak of its powers as well. He has been there, seen it, done it. He uh, and and yeah, the first ever acid rain photo session was taken by Tony Mottram. Poor man. Um, anyway, look, we th this is a little. This is a. This was done a little while ago. Um, I gave it Tony to Tony to 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 flag up any edits, and uh, he listened to the whole thing. Came back to me and said, "Oh fuck it, just put it out as it is." So, 
true to form, and as requested by Tony Mottram himself, here we are having a chat just a little while ago. Hello there. I'm free. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, um, finally got you. How are you? Oh, yeah, I'm pretty good. My daughter's got coronavirus. But luckily, I don't live with her. Uh, I don't know if that's a double-edged sword or what. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's, you've got it the right way around, at least. Yeah, that's right. It's two big girls went to bloody Amsterdam with her boyfriend well, last I... week. Oh, uh, were, they able to, were they able to get there? Yes, but uh, I was surprised they even got back. But yeah, exactly. But I thought that's an unnecessary trip if I've ever heard one. But uh, hey, you know what it's like when you're young. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, so... I'm sure we did stupid things and even more risky things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed. Well, fu- well, funnily enough, do you know what? Um, I am. Um, I, I I've been doing a little bit of research. And um, I got straight. Oh. I, I got straight to your website, and I had a look at your. Uh, I had a look at your gallery, and straight off the bat, but artists beginning with A that you've worked with, and it starts with Alien Sex Fiend. We're not in there anyway, you bastard! <laughs> You're kidding me. You're not in there. No, we're not. No. Really? Now, yeah. which website? Now, okay, which website are you looking at? Um, now um, this is this is where the problem lies. TonyMottramArchive.co.uk. Right. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, 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 so that means you're an Apple Mac man, doesn't it? Uh, no, I'm on a I'm on a I'm on a, a Windows laptop. PC. Windows oh, okay, laptop. you're on a PC. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If you go and Google this, have you got it in front of you now? I have. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you go to. Uh, blah, blah, blah www.tonymottram.co.uk Right, not archive, Tony Mottram. No, no, Tony Mottram. Yeah. Dot, dot dot co. .uk Right, OK. OK. Yeah. I'm, and I'm, I, have you got any luck? You've got a, it's a Flash website. And ah, how, got, do you, how do you know that? Because it's required, because it's re- required me to run Flash on it. Ah, see, so there you go. What, whatever that fucking means is different. I don't know what it means, but <laughs> and and we but, are in, and we are indeed in there. <laughs> ah, so you are on that one, yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> See, but at least you did navigate to A to Z quite quickly. Well, to, to, okay. To be honest, I think by the by the looks of it, your pre your previous list um, actually starts. Um, on the other website, it starts with Alien Sex Fiend. So it looks like it's yeah. the same list, but it just starts a bit later. That's right. So it, it somehow cut Because that archive one is something I had to knock up fairly recently. Fairly recently. That could mean a year or so. Yeah. Because um, this one that you're looking at, the .co.uk, used to be dot com tony Marshall dot com okay yeah and then what went wrong was um somebody was meant to be managing it for me and they didn't and i lost it so i didn't have any so we what we've done we've done com and dot co dot uk so they run parallel for right. some reason dot coms obviously i'm sure you know better than i do they last less, and you have to upgrade them. And because somebody who was looking after it for me had it running on his server, so although that's my domain name, it was on his server as something else. Okay? Yeah. So when you went to it, say, I don't really get half of these things, but I know what buzzwords are now. So his was to do with that. So when I got billed for something, I thought, well, well, hang on, what the fuck's this? It's nothing to do with me. And the bloke had moved to Germany, so I, you know, you just lose contact a little bit. When he was in Leicester, it was piss easy. Um, anyway, he moved to Germany. Then he didn't tell me that this had run out. Then he bollocked me for saying, oh, well, you should have just paid it. I said, hang on, <laughs> it's easy, all well and good. It's only like, well, I don't know, whatever, 29 quid or something. But when you're skint, every penny counts. And also, that's what you were meant to be fucking doing. <laughs> so why didn't you fucking pay it? And then I paid you back. And 
Oh, well, I'll move to Germany. OK, right, OK. Problem is, top.com's gone. Somebody then, I just went to renew it, and then somebody, then it said somebody actually owns it. Yeah. So you obviously get these people who trawl for anything that's .com or sounds like somebody's name. They grab it, try and sell it back to you, and you know, I think it was a Japanese company that had it, and I don't know whether they looked at it because they thought it looked like it's really expensive. Of course, Ozzy Osbourne, and, you know, Prince. Oh, yeah, he's loaded. Oh, brilliant. And it was like, yeah, OK, well, give it back. It's my fucking name. Yes. Oh, we own it now. No, this is wrong. You know, I'm not fucking going to ever go out and pretend I'm Howard. I might be acid rain, with, <laughs> you know, w- with one roadie or something. You know what I mean? Like, there's always three different Saxons on the road and two fucking UB40s or however many. But I said, it's a fuck- it's obvious. Look, I am Tony Moxon. Oh, well, we got it. Well, you fucking nicked it, isn't it? Um, and it's a just stupid world. You know, they don't do that with your car, do they? Well, Nobody comes um, and sits in your car. Well, it's actually, it's actually a defined crime. It's called cyber squatting. And, um, yes, it is, that's right, yeah. And, and it is illegal, but the trouble is that... As we found, there's having laws on the internet, uh, internet, and then there's enforcing them, which is another matter ah, yes, in, of entirely. Course, yes. So then, my tech man, um, you know, said, "Okay, we'll keep monitoring this." And um, it was one of those very weird coincidences that then I said to me, "Mate, fucking hell, did, what, can you remember when that was?" He said, "Oh, it was about this time of year, wasn't it?" And we looked up on the site. And by coincidence, it was, and it was only the fact that we looked it up, and it was there. So he had re- it was time for it to be renewed, so it was a year later, and we managed to buy it back for, you know, nothing. You know what I mean? So I claimed it back. So, obviously, the squatters sat on it for a year and had more, you know, other other people that they could actually make money out of. And the bloke that helped me set it up, strangely, do you know a recording studio in or rehearsal room in Birmingham called Madhouse? Um, I know of it. I don't know it. Okay, the asylum venue? Uh, yeah, I know the venue. Yeah, that's all part of that thing. And that's Roy Davis, who used to be in Shy. Well, he was trying to set up a record company, which he sort of has, I think. And it was his designer that helped me do the, you know, put the thing together. But the server bloke was another friend of his who'd got onto uh, web, the web world, internet and all that really early on. And strangely, I would now call him a bit of a wanker and a bastard because he made a lot of money by registering things like davidbeckham.com, manchesterunited.com. Uh, I know one that's really, really upset me. He, he registered royalmarines.com. And obviously, I don't, I don't know how much he charged for these things, but when you know the bubble came and everybody wanted and needed to have these things, he managed to sell things back because it was a very early in the career of it, and people didn't even know, I wouldn't have thought they'd have that term, cyber squatting. Yeah. Um, so he sold things back to Beckham, and, you know, I don't know, I don't know what, but the one thing that really fucked me off was that royalmarines.com, I don't know what their website is, I think it might be theroyalmarines.com, but I thought, you fuck with it. You know, I'm really not that much of a fucking, you know, breadhead. Well, I'm not a breadhead at all, but, to do it to somebody like the Royal Marines or the Commandos or, you know, something people actually give their fucking life for, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I just thought that was bang wrong. And I do remember it, uh, he told me a few years after we I'd lost contact with him and then he wanted me to take some photos of him because now he thought he was a, um, a script writer, blah, 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 blah. And then he told me and he actually went to court and he won it because... Um, because he did it actually as the very first thing, and it wasn't cyber squatting. Right. But it was just like, why go to, you know, what? and he was a sort of wanker that just wanted the publicity. And he, he sent me a, a link to, a you know, a Times article about it. Yeah, of course, it was really scathing. You know, it's like, 
I wouldn't be surprised if he was, he was a cunt who fucking did NHS.com. But maybe those NHS. is not .com, but it's NHS.gov.uk. You know, and that's why all those things have opened up, haven't they? There's all these different sorts. But obviously .com was the one you really want to have as an international player. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I never, I never, I, I thought dot co dot uk okay it's fine it makes you sound like you're a british trading company but dot com obviously sounds worldwide and if you look at the pictures from aussie to well from a to acdc and acid rain to z <laughs> <and X for Zentric. laughs> well, <laughs> well i mean i mean you've literally yeah you've literally gone the a to z there i mean what do you um uh you know are you still are you still full-time in the game um <laughs> Oh, you would have known that, Howard. Of course you would. You would have known I'm not. Ha ha! Uh, are you recording this? Or, I, I, or I will we... be. I am. I am recording. Yes, as we right. um, uh, just as it be. It's a good. It's a good start to you know a good place to start with where where you're at now, kind of, and then sort of yeah. track back. Oh well, um, I, I, I've made a few mistakes in my life. Um, I've not shied away from those mistakes, um, but. No, I'm not doing it full time. I don't get me wrong. I'm not going to. This is maybe something you might wish to edit out. <laughs> um, no, seriously. Uh, do you look at things like classic rock, planet rock? Yes. And, right. Now, I would have thought if you look at my list, which you have found, and you found the proper list, which you are actually in. Yeah. Um, I would have thought classic rock would at least have one picture every fucking month from from me. Not because of the fact that it's A to Z, literally, but there were bands like Acid Rain, Zentrix, Onslaught, who were with people like Music for Nations, and I really had a great time shooting these people, and we went into studios and made the pictures rather special, not just snapshots or just fucking gig pictures. Yeah. And they most probably haven't been seen really for 30 years. Um, I would have thought they couldn't do it. But I do get the very weird impression that I am vetoed from Classic Rock. They only ever seem to use anything through a photo agency. And the worst thing is photo agencies take quite a percentage of your money. Yeah. Now, when I... When I managed to regain .com, I was working with a chap who I didn't realise it was a long-term plan to rip me off. And this, the tech guy was brilliant, and so we managed to get .com back, reset it up, and the guy said, well, this is a great idea, because when, he went, when the industry went digital, I couldn't really afford to digitise myself. And photo agencies had all my analog photography, and so they were starting to digitize it. But when the actual original photography went to digital, and most stuff was coming in digital, they then, the agencies returned back all the original slides and negatives that they held and expected the photographers then to digitize the stuff. Okay, it took 30 years to shoot. I wonder how long it would take to scan everything and clean it up and edit it. See, in the good old days when you shot such transparency, you'd give the whole shoot to MFN or to the band management. They'd give it to the record company or whatever, and they work from it. But to be honest, it was quite easy. But now with digital, you know, you have to adjust it and all this. And when you scan an old negative, you'll find scratches and dirt on it from, you know, especially when it had been to a magazine and returned to you in a carrier bag. This is what happened when Raw magazine closed down. I gave you the photos back, just a random carrier bag full of photos. Right, Um, okay. So so I've still got those, and I just haven't... uh, Anyway, so uh, I'm not doing this full-time. When it went digital, obviously all the, the prices went down. We are still being paid... I think we paid 30% of the money we were paid 30 years ago. Yeah. So um, I went through some, you know, a bad patch and made some big mistakes. And what the problem, I think, is I have confronted a journalist or two. Um, one of them, I nearly fucking ripped his face off, nearly knocked him out. Uh, and then he sort of 
um, had a go at my wife, and she said, no, you nearly said his name. I said, no, if she said no, he told me all about everything before we even got married. You know, when this woman, I, I've been married four years, and I've never been married before in my life, and um, I wouldn't say she tracked me down, but I'd always, I bumped into her, and I met her, and I said to this journalist, who the hell is she? She just fits a fiddle. And, and he went, oh, oh, she's engaged to a member of the band. And I said, yeah, but who is she? And he thought, he, he was one of these classic cases, oh, don't you fucking try and get in her pants because that's my favourite band. Oh, I thought that's you. It's like, no. Anyway, when we ended up speaking 35 years after we met in a fucking <laughs> rehearsal room, yeah. um, she said, I always fancied you. And I said, yeah, I've always fancied you. And it was like, yeah, right. And I said, yeah, right. And so she said, I told my mates. I said, well, they're not good enough mates. They shouldn't have told me. Now, I was in a very long-term relationship at the time. But I'm not saying that everybody was clean and driven snow. So in a way, it was a good job we didn't have an affair back then because maybe we wouldn't be married now. But we're the happiest we've ever been in our lives. Um, I'm her third husband. And the first one, she admits, you know, in fact, they were never for love. She wanted a child. She got pregnant. And she said, and the bloke said, oh, I'll marry you. And she said, oh, well, you might as well. Not that she wanted to. And then <laughs> it went terribly wrong when she'd had two kids. And then she married some wanker on uh, the rebound. And since when we contacted each other on Facebook and then spoke on Skype, I just realized, shit, you know, I'm not saying I'm not saying I would have been a great man at the time because I would have destroyed a long term relationship that I was in. But hey ho, the older you get, the more wise you are. And one of those lines I will really use: "What is it about um, um, something that it's wasted on youth? What is it? Um, um, I don't know energy is wasted on youth or whatever. Uh, uh, you know. uh, wisdom, wisdom is wasted wisdom. on the young." Yeah, yeah, exactly. If we'd known then, you know, we would have made it. But hey-ho, I'm 61 now, and I got married, you know, for the first time four years ago. Although my daughter was born when I was 40 by a, uh, an interim relationship, and that went wrong. But because of those sort of things, and uh, subsequently I've met a few photographers, because I think of the nature of photographers, we are meant to be up front and, you know, uh, I think I I found out through my photography, which was pointed out by my, I suppose, tech guru, he says every time he was looking through the photos because we were starting to scan things together, there was always a set of pictures where the people are pissing themselves laughing. And I'd, I'd get some, I'd, I'd do it on purpose just to try and make somebody do something, I'd do something stupid, whereas... I don't know, but when I put those pictures out, he'd always say, yeah, that's a fucking Mottram picture. What the fuck did you say to them? So I don't know, but it was obviously something fucking stupid. <laughs> and but obviously you you and <laughs> I, when I had showed him your prints, which was, I think, were they used in sounds? But I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, it, was, it would have been 87. Yeah. yeah, well, I say I've got all those original. Well, not all of them, but loads of them came back from sound. And... and we did that. In fact, it was great because you were playing up to the camera. You always did. And then when we did those fish eye shots in the studio, and um, yeah. your, you had a long haired member of the band in that horrible old dirty old Mac yes. and things like that. So this is weird. I can remember that, you see. And I haven't looked at them because I thought, I sort of have this weird photographic memory. I know every picture I've taken. We were looking at um, oh, a couple of years ago. Um, somebody turned on a page of a daily, a Sunday Mirror, Sunday Mail, and there was this picture, the size of a posted stamp, of Richie Blackmore. I said, oh, that's my picture. And they said, oh, how do you know? I said, has it got credit? And they went, no. I said, no, it is mine. And so then the next week I rang up my agency and said, did you sell a picture of the, Sunday, the Mail on Sunday or whatever it's called? And they said, yeah. And uh, But I could even tell across a breakfast table <laughs> a picture of mine so i do know them i, I would there's something about what i did because i twisted them a bit but 
even with live photos, I can usually tell which one's mine, not the bloke next to me. You know, a dog. Yeah. Term. So, so uh, things like that. But I uh, say so that was the other weird thing that. Sorry, anyway, I, was, I do bounce around. But yeah, so um, I found out subsequently that a few other photographers who've had a bad time uh, at about. And then, in fact, there's a journalist who I know now has, in fact, moved out of England. We, he, he could write some fantastic material. But because of something that somebody thought he did, and there's a small amount of rumour in it, so a small amount of truth in it, but he basically was blackballed. Um, and another person, there was a supposed incident in a taxi cab that supposedly people witnessed after a party or a, uh, you know, a, a backstage thing. And somebody said this, and so they always take the victim, supposed victim side. So um, <clears throat> so I don't think that has helped my my cause. Yeah. So, uh, um, so it's, I think Rock have been very good to me, and they actually do actually, I've asked them, can you send me what you're looking for? I said, look, I don't expect you to use all my stuff at all, but it would be nice because I'm sitting here in my front room and there's a pile, literally a pile of original slides and negatives and envelopes of little angels. I've never scanned any of my little angel stuff, right. although I've done quite a bit of work with Toby Jepson and Wayward Sons over the last couple of years. Also, there's a pile of envelopes of Man of War, and I've never scanned those. Now, obviously, you try and scan all your ACDC stuff, your Aerosmith stuff, your Motorhead stuff, and particularly if somebody passes away, some of the stuff is with the agencies, but not all of it, because, as I said, they gave them back to me, and I couldn't even afford a scanner at the time. So my life these days is pretty much every day scanning some stuff, and it's great when a magazine says, by the way, it's an anniversary of this album or the band are reforming. So they'll give me a couple of weeks' notice to be able to scan the stuff. So the good thing is, mine is my work isn't like Ross Houghton, who was flogged out. He flogged everything. You know, yeah. when you look in classic rock, you'll see, oh, not the same fucking picture of Def Leppard in their fucking you know, um, Union Jack shorts and vests. Yeah, yeah. You know, how many fucking times have I seen that? Robert Ellis, how many times have I seen that fucking ACDC at Nebworth or Amazon Odeon? You know, um, where are my rust shots? You know, nobody called me about my rust shots. You know, bloody bloody. Um, there were a few years when I was quite bitter about it. But if I can sell, you know, a couple of pictures a month, you know, it helps me get by. Um, of course, I had lots of money once upon a time back in the day, but it was squandered. Um, I bought a flat, and then I bought a, swapped that for a house. And then um, the missus at the time, although we weren't married, wanted a bigger house, so we bought the house. And then I was thrown out of it by her and the daughter. And um, although my name's on the deeds, um, it don't mean anything to me. As long as my daughter gets it. That's if she doesn't die of fucking coronavirus, coronavirus. before or too late. <laughs> <laughs> but do you know what I mean? What's the fucking point? Spill milk, isn't it? What's the point in crying? Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, so is, is, if people want to buy if people want to buy shots that you've taken, is the best place to go um, your uh, tonymottram.co.uk? Yes. Uh, uh, yes. And say so what's interesting at the moment, there is a chat who is supposedly help, supposedly helping me resurrect.com. Now, I've got that back. So if you do tonymartin.com, you will find it, it'll say under construction. Right. Okay. So tonymartin.com is under construction. tonymartin.co.uk is there, but obviously it's not Apple friendly, so you won't get it on the phone. Uh, but right. the thing that the thing that you can do is which you obviously did is the Tony Mottram archive dot com is Apple friendly, although sadly, which is brilliant, thank you for pointing that out, 
it obviously hadn't fully updated as it should. Yeah. Okay, so you've got these three things, and you can easily, whenever you wish, publish my phone number. I don't care who phones me, because if I don't know the number, I don't answer it. If they leave a message, then you'll get back to them. Yeah. So if they're a professional, they know how to use a fucking phone. <laughs> <laughs> and also, you can easily publish Tony Mottram photo at gmail.com as an email. Yeah. So... Um, I wish there were yellow pages, like for websites and email addresses, but, you know, I'm sorry, that's me being Luddite again. Telephone books? What's that for? I thought they were only for little members in bands to stand on for a photo shoot. Ah, (laughs) Howard, did I ask you to stand on a... No, you weren't that small. (laughs) (laughs) So um, I'm possibly the poorest I've ever been, but I would say I'm the happiest I've ever been because I'm really in love and... As a married man, and it's great. And to be honest, I uh, I don't feel as though I should live my life any differently than I've ever done. Um, as you know, I don't take anything seriously, except I do my photography, my images, and I like detail. So yeah, I've been through shit. Um, there, are, you know, the, people do say, "Oh, you think yeah. I've got over a hundred thousand images, negatives, slides, and." You know, even digital work. So, yeah, I do still shoot. I did quite a bit of stuff with James Toesland. Um, I did his first album cover. Oh, yeah. Um, done, done quite a bit of stuff with uh, Toby Jepsen and Wayward Sons. Well, does, does Toby still t- still manage uh, Toesland? I'm never quite sure. I don't think he does. And I'm not sure if he ever actually managed him. Right. But I'm not sure what the relationship was. Because I know Toby produced it and i do believe toby um wrote together with james right okay because james had some great material so it was the funny thing was when i got a call saying or an email from uh, toby saying i want you to do this thing with james Toby, and i said to my wife grace oh i've got toby wants me to do a shot with great james Toby, and she said what the james Toby?" i said what is there such a thing as a James Toesland? <laughs> I said, who the fuck is he? I don't know. I've never heard of him. Yeah. But obviously, she's a biker. Yeah. And guess what? She rode a Ducati. And I understand that he rode Ducatis when he won his two um, world champions. That's right, so when yeah. We went down, so when we went down to do the photo shoot, Grace happened to have one of those really cool Ducati motorcycle jackets. And she rode a Ducati Monster motorcycle. Funny enough, the number plate was MON666. So she'd inherited that on the bike, but obviously somebody who'd had it got that number plate, MON666. So when we went down to the photo shoot, I, I said to James, this is my wife. And she said, oh, we've got something. Guess what? You and me have got something in common, James. And he said, yeah, what? A big dick? <laughs> I looked at him. <laughs> He just literally met my and she falls about and I said, What? What did you say? And he <laughs> and it was like oh, he's really, really down to earth. Have you ever met him? Um, I haven't, no. Um or, but I I've kind of like I've I've had a conversation. Right. He's a he's he's a very down to earth fellow. Um, you know, say he's a world champion, twice world champion, so and he's married to Katie Melua. Uh, and did, did you know that did you know he's married to Katie Melua? I didn't know. Yeah, well, what happened was um, when he wasn't riding because he broke his wrist, um, he was meant to take his mum to see Katie Melua. So when they took, when he did get to this gig and he took his mum to see Katie Melua and he's sitting in the front row with his mum, the keyboard player kept looking over. James realised, what's this keyboard player? Do you fancy my mum or something? And he kept looking at him. And anyway, I think when the show ended, I think the keyboard player came to the front and said, you're James Tozen, didn't you? He said, who's James Tozen? Anyway, he said, would you like to come backstage? And and he said, yeah, because my mum wants to meet Katie. <laughs> so he went back. The keyboard player introduced James's mum to Katie. And <laughs> and so she says, how do you know this bloke? If you're going to, Can you know who he is? And Katie goes, who? Oh, I don't know. Who the fuck is he? He goes, he's James Hoseland. You know, and she went, and? 
Well, Clive won most of the championship and the bloke, you know, said, he's still riding. He says, not really. Look at me fucking wrist. It's all in, you know, scarred up and that. Yeah. And the key will play, so oh, I'd love to go on the back of your bike one day. I'll oh, give us a ride. And he said, yeah, that could be arranged. You know, I'm still proper racing, but yeah. And Peggy Melua turns around and says, the key will play, fuck off. You're not getting a ride on the back of a fucking racing bike. If anyone does, it's fucking me. And she actually asked and blinded. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so James then took her out and then they ended up being married. So then I believe he did take the keyboard player out. And I do believe the keyboard player has played second keyboards with James on some dates. Right. Okay. So, so it's really weird when somebody knows somebody and knows somebody doesn't and other people do. So, you know, it's like any talent. I will never diss anybody because I think everybody's got talent. It might not show. I might not know about it, but give everybody, you know, the opportunity. Uh, and, you know, the, but that's one thing I get back to sort of Ross Alfred. I, be, I believe he's meant to be quite a nasty person. <laughs> and uh, he's been incredibly rude to a lot of people I know. He's been quite rude to me, but um, now he knows I'm not direct competition to him. Um, he has been relatively cool, but he's still wound up his own fucking arsehole. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I've, I, 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 I've heard, um, I, yeah, I've heard, I've heard interesting things, n- n- none of them particularly positive. Which is a real shame, because what's interesting as well, um, I've done a couple of lectures at um, a couple of universities over my years, and um, this weekend it was meant to be the photo show in Birmingham or last weekend, and uh, Mick Hudson, who used to work for Metal Hammer, or still maybe works for Metal Hammer, um, he's done some stuff because he tied up with Olympus. He was an Olympus um, ambassador, and they gave him lens, cameras and lenses. And Halfwit has got, I think, some deals sometimes with um, Nikon and stuff like that. But this year, Ross Halfin was meant to be one of the guest speakers. And somebody told me this. And they said, are you going to go and heckle? I said, well, actually, some people should. But the point is, he's not really a photographer. Excuse me. He's not really a photographer. He takes photos for a living. Of course he does. But I don't think he ever studied photography. I studied photography as photography, as a technical thing. Then I started out in advertising, which was really, really very technical. And... I think I think I was one of the first people to have a studio which I shared with Ray Palmer, and I think we were the first couple of people to take lights on the road with us. Alfin never did, but then when he did, he got um, an assistant and some assistants, and I believe one of his first assistants was Jimmy Page's daughter, who wanted to get into photography, and obviously Ross wanted to get. Um, to be pally with um, uh, what's his name um, guitar player Jimmy Page so this is something don't put down that I would have said but he is I've heard him being referred to as Jimmy Page's poodle as the last couple of years right. you know so so he'll run around but now I understand Scarlet Page is a photographer in her own right but don't forget the weird industry has changed if you can afford to put on Exhibitions, you can do exhibitions. I've had one or two. I can't even afford. I can't afford to do them. So you know, pe- people will still, still, people will still come out for those things then. Oh, I think they do. Listen, if Jimmy Page is likely to be there, of course they'll go to an exhibition, won't they? <laughs> True. And and uh, if Jimmy paid for it, you know he could put a really cool guest list, and it would obviously end up in the tap, though, wouldn't it? Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, so, so what I was going to say is, it's, it's ironic that the year Ross was supposed to be um, giving a talk, um, it's been cancelled due to coronavirus. But <laughs> I wonder what he would have said because he's so rude to people. You know, he's never helped. I've never heard of him help anybody. You know, yeah. uh, all he'll do. I believe he has a blog and. I understand. I don't want to read it. I think his blog. People say I should do one, but I just don't have the time to do it. You know, I've got a day job, which 
is a driving job and it's a split shift. Um, right. I, uh, um, which is great because it means I can do my scanning in the middle of the day. Except um, I'm on a different contract now. So I used to be finished by about 10.30 and then go back about 2.30. But now, as, as you know, I'll get back about 11 and have to go out at 1. Okay, great. I'm getting a 40 plus hour week, <laughs> which I need. And so when I get photos using those magazines, um, you know, they are bonuses. And I still get a buzz out seeing them. But I say last month, I think Planet Rock used a really big picture of Ricky Warwick, which, to be honest, was like a brand new shot. It's, you know, something that would have been used in Raw once 30 years ago. And, um, you know, if people are interested in that sort of thing, it's a really good shot. It was shot in the studio with some flames. It's a double exposure. So some of my, I wouldn't have ever seen Ross do anything like that. You know, he might have somebody lighter photos. But he does. He doesn't do really creative photography. But did he? Um, did he just make his? Has he just made his name off hanging onto Metallica's coattails, like like um, so many like so many of us? Well, which obviously I was the first fucking photographer. And I haven't really got the fuck out of shit out of it, was I? Have I? So I'm trying to do a book at the moment. But anyway, yeah, I was the first photographer to do work with him in '83. Um, but obviously, Ross was pally with Peter Mensch who then took over, and that's why he did it. But the other interesting story, this is really between you and I, and I can't guarantee it's 100% correct, but Ross's dad was a songwriter in Tin Pan Alley. Right. Have you ever heard a song called You're a Pink Toothbrush, I'm a Blue Toothbrush? Uh, no. Right, uh, although, 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 I don't know. I, now, now you say that, I think I can, I can kind of hear it. Yes. Well, Google it afterwards, and it was a sort of very well-known comedian, had a big hit with it. And for many years, I was told that it was written for Ross and his sister to clean their teeth. Well, I was at the reunion gig of Mama Hoople, and Ross was there, and I said, Ross, I'm sorry about it. Oh, what are you fucking doing here? He goes... What do you mean? I thought you retired. What? Because I don't live in London. Uh, <laughs> you know, and I said, no, no, no. But, you know, uh, I do other things and I would prefer to be taking photos every day of rock bands. But I might not necessarily nowadays because you get first three numbers and all this shit and everybody thinks they're a fucking photographer. And, oh, anyway. Yeah, um, I, 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 absolutely, I, absolutely. I mean, we, we get approached as soon as we announce a tour or anything like that, which, funnily enough, we just have. I'll, yep. get, I'll get an inbox full of, oh, I'd love to come and shoot Acid Rain. And oh, blah, blah, and I go and look at their profile and it's like, you know, bus driver, butcher. Yeah. And I'm like, well, uh, with the greatest and, and respect. There's nothing we... wrong with that. Yeah. But <laughs> if you can afford to buy a camera, nowadays you can get cameras that shoot in pitch black. More money spent. But when we were doing it, it was this literally a dark art. Yes. And, <laughs> yeah, um, no, yeah, literally. <laughs> yeah, no, it really, really was, yeah. Really, so really dark, I, right? I remember when I went to college and said, um, how do I do this? And they, they said, oh, no, you don't do that to next year. I said, I don't care. Whether I, do. I said, I want to know. That's what I want to do. And because I was at a technical course, it was a bit of a fight for me to be told, well, that's wrong. You, you, it means you're underexposing and overprocessing. And I said, yeah, okay. Still words I don't understand because obviously I do know I'm asking an advanced photography question. But that's what I'm here for, and so I then managed to learn about those things. But anyway, going back to the story, and I said to Ross, is this true that this song was written? And he reluctantly went, mm, 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 yeah. So his dad was a songwriter in Tim Pan Alley. So I believe he had, Ross had major opportunity to go to concerts and to do photos. And I wouldn't be surprised if his father bought him a really good camera. And, you know, not saying there's anything wrong with it, you know. No, nothing wrong get, with that. Kids get, daddy buys them a fucking Gibson Les Paul double neck or whatever they want. But it doesn't mean that they're a good fucking guitar player. Yeah. But um, I'm sure we've all met kids who had really brilliant kit, but they couldn't fucking play even if you, you know, even if you played it for them. They didn't even hold the guitar, let alone play it. All the gear, and, you, all the gear and no idea. Yeah, well, it's more so because 
there seems to be more money floating around. And fucking hell, what weirds me out is every kid who becomes 18 or 17 now seems to have a fucking brand new car. I've never had a brand new car in my fucking life. You know, but <laughs> mummy and daddy buy them. And guess what? Within a, eight months, they'll fucking wrap it around a tree. Fucking hell. I know. Well, anyway, I go into all these things. But um, so I went to college and my, <laughs> my jeans were held together with gaffer tape. And I had to have a car because I was, honestly, it was really brilliant. Um, and um, I, had a, I had a little Ford Escort van that I went to college in because it was embarking and I wouldn't have been able to get there on time using public transport. And I remember the front, the front headlights were held in with gaffer tape. And uh, the reason I got into photography, it was I was in a band in 1975 and... 74, 75, and we supported Sin Lizzy in our local town park. So please go onto my Facebook and go to my all my photos. Um, the photography one you'll find really interesting because that's got quite a weird cross-section of photography. So there's a lot in there, so skip through that. But you'll see photos of me at school, which is Burnt Mill School, where I went to school with Glenn Hoddle, who became the England manager. Um, we had a band called Iron Orchid, um, which is stolen from a Michael Moorcock book because I was really big into um, Hawkwind at the time. And recently, a mate of mine has given me a pristine poster from our first gig we ever did in Harlow. And um, he said, I suppose I need that. So I want to get that framed because what really, it was really funny. We'd had a rehearsal and we had a gig at a... Um, sit form school common room and um, there was a bloke who used to do all the posters for the local college and things and we walked around and and the local shopping centre somebody said oh fuck what's that I said it's a gig isn't it he said is that a name I didn't agree with that I thought you did I thought oh fuck well we're going to have to stick with it now aren't we can't fucking change the name after we booked a few gigs but guess what? We live in Harlow. And guess where we recorded our demo tapes? A place called Spacewood Studios in Cambridge. Now, do you ever know a really important band that did their demos at Spacewood Studios in Cambridge? Um, I don't. They were called Iron Maiden. Hey! Well, the weirdest thing was, when we, <laughs> when we were in that college and my mates were working and our drum was at school, we got a demo tape to EMI, and we actually got called in. We had an interview at EMI Records. And we're sitting there, and somebody goes, look at that. And we're looking up, and I say, what is it? That's where the Beatles had their picture taken. Who the Beatles? are cunts. I don't like them. I like Rolling Stones. But we were sitting under that stair, and we had this interview, and they did say, this was 1975, if you cut your hair and play a bit faster, we said, sure, we can do something with you. I suppose a bit like the band 999, who were slightly older than us, and maybe were like a pub sort of scene type band. But I'm just wondering if we ever got the interview because they got us the names mixed up, thinking we were Iron Maiden. Because obviously Steve Harris came from Waltham Stowe, and they were around pretty much the same, and the fact that they used the same studios as us. Well, here's a good one, Howard. Um... Must have been 20 years ago. I mean, I don't know when it was, but what happened when in those days you could rent tape? Did you ever do that? Rent the tape to do your demos? Um, no, we always we always um, we always went for it and actually, um, you know, right, just bought it all. Yeah. Well, this is what I remember them. They did. You could rent the tape. You could have a brand new tape. You can use second hand tape. You know, all those things that went on on these four-track or eight-track studios, you know? Yeah. And somebody's dad could afford to pay for the tape, whether it was a new one or second hand, we did that. Anyway, due to Facebook, we tried to contact each other. and In fact, I think it was just before Facebook. Anyway, I rang them up and said, have you got our tapes there? They said, well, I don't know. We'd have to have a look. If you bought them, we should have them on store. So a week later, I get a phone call said, yeah, yeah, we got your tapes. Okay, and then you write out the, the track titles, and I think 
she did two de- demos, a three track and a four track. And um, I thought, oh, brilliant, can we come and collect them? And I said, yeah, brilliant, because, you know, <laughs> we don't want all this stuff stored here. Obviously, we don't know where people are nowadays. And, yeah, we're surprised at anyone. But they were brilliant. They didn't just chuck stuff away. So when I turned up in Cambridge, I said, oh, I'll come and get my tapes. And the bloke said, oh, well, the Iron Maiden tapes. And I looked at the partner at the time and looked at him and thought, okay, do I say anything? <laughs> what, you've actually got real Iron Maiden? But the thing is, obviously, I would have said to Steve Harris, hello, Harris, I've got your tapes here. And he, <laughs> But <laughs> I, said, you know, I said, you ain't got theirs, have you? But because I don't think they could afford to, whatever, or they had got them back. But he actually gave us our tapes. Well, I was a bass player, and I never told anyone this. And um, <laughs> um, when I recently got together, in fact, we weren't married, so this would have been four or five years ago. Um, my missus, her best fre- one of her best friends, husband, is in um, British Lion now. He's a guitar player. Oh, right, yeah. Graham Leslie. But anyway, I said to Grace, have you ever, because she lived in Chelmsford and we've come in through Essex. And I said, have you ever been around Steve Harris's house? And she said, oh, no, I'd love to, you know, 14th century place where the studio is. I said, oh, well, we'll be going past it on the way through Harlow. I said, oh, let's pop in. So I turned down a farm lane and it was the wrong lane. Oh, fuck, I must have forgotten where Harry is, Steve Harris is. So we pull up and I go down this next lane. That's it, there's a big brick wall with a gate in it. And I said, shut down, on, let's not. She said, oh, don't be fucking daft. Yeah, of course I will. So I went up and buzzed the buzzer. said, here, is Harry in? And I said, he said, who's that? I said, oh, it's Mottram. And then the fucking electric gate's open. So I'm going, what? So <laughs> the missus kind of, what? So we drive in. Have you ever been to Steve's house? I haven't, mate. Okay, well, as you drive in, there's little trees and a little, a little wooded bit. And they've got a big fucking great Eddie head there. And when you go over one of those things in the road, the Eddie head lights up and flashes, and his eyes flash at you. And um, so that happens. And they say, oh, fucking hell. And then they, there's a, he's got a telephone box on the left. And then you see he's, he's got a football pitch in, his out, in the back garden. And I said, oh, I told her about a football pitch. And I said, anyway, it's really funny. Fuck me. There's a grandstand. That wasn't there when I went. And fuck me. He's actually got spotlights on his football pitch in his back garden. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you go around, and I said, fuck me, I haven't seen those. So next to his house, he's got this pub that he built. And uh, then you've got the front of the 14th century house. He says, oh, where'd we go? And I said, well, I've never been through the front of the house because I think this 14th century house, the door's really a bit too small for a real human being. And, I, and she said, well, do you think you'll be in the pub? I said, I have no idea. And out of the back kitchen door he comes and stands with his arms folded. Hello, Mottram, what the fuck are you doing here? And I said, uh, this is my missus. Um, you've met her before, but she ain't been to your house. And uh, he says, you're fucking lucky I'm here, really, because he was meant to be selling the house. Or it was one of those things, it was up to six million quid or 6.6 million, you know what I mean? And uh, the estate agent had done something wrong in the catalogue and he'd come back to England for that Christmas to get the sales brochure done correctly. And um, so he said, oh, pop in. Oh, I was about to go shopping. I said, no, I ain't going to come around to hang around. It was just a bit of a laugh to come and see. And they meet the missus. And she said, can I go look around the house? And he said, yeah, because obviously I told about that and the parties and, you know, his house is... It's very spinal tap because he's got all the stage. Yeah, um, yeah. He, he, he just know, hasn't got. He just hasn't got um, uh, Stonehenge in the front garden. Well, the, I wouldn't be surprised if he's in the back now, if you know what I mean. Yeah. But no, he's got his football pins in the front and all this. So yeah, it was so fucking funny. And so he says, "Do you want a drink, Tony?" And I says, "Oh, what are you drink?" He says, "Oh, I've given up drinking." So yeah, we got a pub on the side. You fucking out. And. And I said, oh, I'll, I'll pint of Ruffles because that's what we always do. Oh, we have, we're, we've only got bottle beer for people because obviously I've taken all the taps off. What's the point having a fucking pub? <laughs> and you've got no taps. Anyway, um, we open up and he says, oh, I, I, I said, oh, you're giving up drink, you're just concentrating on sports. I said, oh, well, let's go and have a kick around then. He says, oh, my legs are too fucking bad for that now. So you've got a fucking house with a pub and you don't drink. You've got a football pitch. 
and your legs are fucking playing out. What's going on here? Anyway, so we, it was really, really funny. And he says, I haven't seen you for 20 years. I went, oh, really? Sorry. <laughs> and it felt like yesterday. Anyway, so we had a right chat. So I said, well, what are you drinking? And um, I think I did have a bottle of beer. Then we did have a coffee. And um, it, was a, it was actually, this is, this is the really, really fucking funny bit. That Grace came down and was like, totally in awe of the house, you know. And I said, well, look, if you're not here, Harry, we could look after it while you're away. You know, let's, we'll, be care, we'll be caretakers for your, for your six million quid out. And, he's, and he gave us this look, yeah, right, you fuck it right up, will you? Yeah, come around, let's party in somebody else's house. Like, really silly. But no, it was quite amusing. And then yes, it was, I think, a couple of days to, um, what's it called, New Year's Eve. And Grace said, oh, what are you doing for New Year's Eve? Oh, said nothing. I'm supposed to be watching telly, be back in. And she goes, and he says, oh, what are you up to? And she says, oh, we're going to a friend's fancy dress party. Now, I'd been to a couple of fancy dress parties at Steve Harris' his house. And she said, oh, I've heard you like uh, the parties. Do you want to come along? And he just looked at her and was like, what? <laughs> no. <laughs> and then I said, here, Harry, guess what? I said, they were meant to have a band playing. And uh, we've just heard yeah. they might have to cancel the cover band. It's going to be a right rock party. But the point is, the bass player's gone sick. Um, because, you know, maybe you can come along and play a bit of bass with them. And Mrs. turns out and says, but Tone, you can play bass, can't you? Mary looked at her and then looked at me. And he was like, of course I'm not going to fucking turn up at a fucking somebody I've never known party and play paranoid with them. Except, of course, he could. And, and he looked at me. What do you mean he plays bass? Oh, didn't he never tell you? I said, no, of course I wouldn't, Grace. Oh, here I go. I'm on tour with Iron Maiden. Yes, right? it's, not, it's, not some, it's not something you're going to tell Steve Harris, is it? Well, it's not usually that you say, here, Steve, interrupt your fucking sound check. I've got a right good idea for a little riff. Can I borrow <laughs> your rig for a minute? Here, yeah. well, you want to play this one, Harry? And it was like, so it was, but the point was, I was called to be the photographer on that Fear of the Dark tour. Because Steve was getting into photography and they fucked Halfrin off because he pissed them off by saying, oh, I can't do it, I'm off with Metallica or Def Leppard. And he, Steve Harris knew that Ross Halfrin would never teach him about photography because he most likely didn't know anything about photography. So I'm there taking photos for Steve as well as doing my band photography. But then that was the most ridiculous thing, saying, so, oh, oh, yeah, sorry, Steve, um, Yes, and then I told him the story when we called Iron Fucking Orchid, and I said I nearly had the other and he's just sitting there shaking his fucking head. Look, you, you, you know, possibly the biggest well-known bases in the rock world, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm confused with you. <laughs> That's brilliant, so, mate. That is brilliant. But the funny thing is, we went, we go and see him when um, British Lions playing, and it's, oh, Tony, what are you doing here? Uh, uh, well, today I'm not actually taking photos. But we did meet him at um, a biker thing, which I knew the people who organised it, the Blues and Rock Festival, and we'd seen him, and it was so funny. Well, what are you doing here then? Well, I'm actually photographing you. Is that all right? <laughs> and he said, of course it fucking is. But some of the people, the press people, would go, Ooh, who's he? And he said, it's all right. I know him. He's photographing the whole show. So, yeah, it is. It's still part of me. Yeah. But, um well, bear with me one. Bear with me one second, Tony, because I've got um, I've got questions from um, from oh. listen, from listeners for you. Oh no! Okay. Okay. So um, this one is from Neil Brannigan Fuller, um, and he says, what... "Oh, not that one. <laughs> yeah, that no. one. No, no. What was his middle name? Brannigan. Oh, I thought you meant Neil Smithy Fletcher. Oh no, 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 no. Don't worry. Don't worry." <laughs> This is Neil Brannigan Fuller. What impact has digital photography had on shooting gigs and bands, both the positive and negative? And do you get frustrated that anyone with an entry-level DSLR and a Facebook page is called a pro photographer these days? Absolutely. I'm fucking annoyed with people with a fucking iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, of course, as, as we have said earlier in our little conversation, yeah, you've got the technology that you can invent light nowadays. When, you know, go out and try it with some film. I'd like that as an experiment. Go, you know, go and try and do it in your fucking bathroom like I did. So, you know, get some film and process it. 
And, you know, how do you know how to boost the chemistry? So, yeah, it is very frustrating. But there's some great photographers out there, and I'm glad, in the long run, as a visual artist, if I could say that word. (laughs) (laughs) Um, um, No, I, I just think it's great that people are becoming a little bit more visually aware. But I think, as you said a little bit like when you announce a tour, everybody wants to get on there. Yeah. Because why are they doing it? Are they doing it because they're a fan? Are they doing it as an art? Are they actually doing it to be what journalists used to be? People and magazines used to, I think, entertain, educate, and um, what was the other E? There were three E's, entertain, educate, and... Um, oh, I forgot what the other one is. We'll figure it out. Uh-huh. Um, I think there was a reason but. Why people are doing these just for their own self gratification? You know what I mean. So it's yeah. a bit really wanking in the wind. <laughs> so uh, yeah, and and I think you know ultimately everyone does it for their different reasons. Um, yeah. And and we I mean we tend to be quite um, uh, uh, well we we do our we do our due diligence on anybody who wants to come in and um, and do anything like that. But um, anyway, yeah. next next question is Stephen Smith. Stephen says. Did Tony do those pictures with Bruce Dickinson in 1988 where he's dressed as a sort of Victorian street urchin slash artful dodger wearing a top hat? Yes, I did. And, uh, Excellent. Did it, says, know, I, it says, if so, I, what was the story behind that and what was it promoting? <laughs> Fuck no, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, that was 30 years ago. I, I do remember certain, I do remember taking the photos. I do remember the box that Bruce is leaning on is a box that I had had in the studio for quite a long time. The best thing is to track down a copy of Raw magazine. Yeah. Because it was a shoot for them, and it, I don't think it was my concept for it. So I think it was one that came... Phil Alexander might actually have the answer for that, because I believe he was the editor at the time. Oh, I had him on, I had him on a couple of weeks ago. I know you said, yes. Yeah, so, so have you spoken to Dave Ling at all? Um, yeah, and I'm hoping to get him on again. Because I have a feeling that Dave was the journalist for that piece. Right. Um, so he might know better. See, so that is where it comes interesting. Sometimes, as a photographer, you can come up with a concept. Sometimes um, you come up with a concept and it backfires. But yeah. some other times... Bruce, it might be the fact that Bruce had done, oh, I know he wrote some books. Maybe it was something to do with being a Dickens-type writer. Yeah, so, yeah. So, so I, I, somebody might have said that, and then I took it. And also, it's pretty much his name, Dickensian Dickinson. So ah, it, might have right, been a, okay. it might well have been a play on that. I do remember um, tracking down the the old flask that he's got and as Bruce was always the member of Iron Man who liked to do things a bit different, he didn't he? Yes. Um, and I say, he still goes on stage with a bloody flying helmet these days, he looks like fucking Roy Chubby Brown, have you noticed that? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's, a, that's worth a laugh, isn't it? And so when I saw the maiden on this whatever the tour was where they got that Spitfire, and he comes jumping around the stage with a fucking flying helmet. I thought, fuck me, it's Roy Chubby Brown. It's, it's, but, um, uh, it's definitely one of his fantasies fulfilled, put it that way. It is, yes, exactly. Yeah. So, um, um, no, I'm glad, uh, funny enough, I recently scanned, scanned that, and uh, I'm now walking downstairs making a coffee while I'm talking, and I'm in my um, downstairs toilet, and um, whenever you come up, you will love being in here. There's pictures I did of a load of harmonica players. I, um, when I played bass, I had little blues bands, and I tried to lo- learn to play harmonica a bit. So I've got all these harmonica play heroes I photographed. Uh, but I've got the shot of Bruce Dickinson that was on the front cover of, I think it was a 1987 Metal Hammer, with Bruce with a slatted background a studio shot and he's got his um, he's bare chested with a leather jacket on and he's looking and which I got signed a while ago if you want me to do snapshots of these to go with a web 
thing at all. Um, I've got in the downstairs picture picture of Bruce looking very gorilla like. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Which is, which is signed. And I've got some really nice signed stuff upstairs, which is one of the things I've been kind of doing over the last few years because you got to know bands as mates. Yeah. And they, in a weird way, they weren't pop stars. No, and, definitely. Um, yeah. yeah. And it's quite nice when you do it. So, so you don't go around, oh, it's just not a bit stupid, so I can have your autograph. Now, do you remember Lingy always used to walk around town with carrier bags full of records? Uh, yeah, still does. Still does. <laughs> yeah, oh, great. And he would always get them fucking autographed. And it's like, sometimes you look down and go, fuck off. But he is a still, he always was an uber fat, and he still is. But yeah. now I'm, as I, <laughs> I'm not saying I'm thinking about dying because of coronavirus, or whatever, um, it's just quite nice when people I don't who I've never really known say, "What did you do? Are these all yours?" Well, and then I've got a photo here signed by Mark Armour, which is really lovely. It says to Tony, "Times gone by, love Mark Armour." That's nice. Now the interesting thing is, it's really nice, but the effect. Remember that he had a terrible motorcycle accident and he lost a lot of his memory. Yes. And so that he did remember that, that's, you know, really quite good. I've got above him a picture of Susie from Susie and the Banshees. It's one of the earliest photos I ever took when I was learning photography down at Bishop Stortford Triad, um, and she signed it to Tony Susie, and that was introduced to her by somebody who was doing a book with her. Below that, I've got a picture of Becky Bondage, the Tony Love Becky, yeah, and she is wearing a state. Trooper T-shirt. Now, do you rem- remember that band, State Trooper? Um, I do. Yeah. And Gary Barnes, the singer. But I have no idea. I can't remember why I've got Becky Bondage modelling a State Trooper shirt, and I do know it was in sound. So it was kind of it's really weird. And uh, she was, she said, "What was that photo about?" I said, "I thought you would actually tell me." So. Um, it's lovely when we have met up with people and you answer the questions and things like that. But um, I'll tell you one interesting concept, hopefully you can edit this, interesting concept thing about where photographers are asked to do something. There's a band, an American band, I believe they're called Saigon Kick. Um, they might be in an MFM band, I am not sure, or Roadrunner. And uh, I've always been a big collector of the combat uniforms of the Vietnam War, a thing called Tiger Stripe. And in fact, I did a book with uh, another fellow. It's all called, weirdly enough, Combat Uniforms of the Vietnam War in Colour Photographs. And um, it's, it, you try and find that on the internet, and it's going for quite big money now. It's only a very small run. Anyway, this I studied, studied the Vietnam War. They've got this band called Saigon Kick, and I had a vintage phrase book from the Vietnam War saying, stand back and please put your hands up. Do not uh, come forward or we will shoot. You know, the period soldier's book. Yeah. So I wrote all this stuff in Vietnamese in the background. So you, you wouldn't have even really seen it, but it would have looked like Vietnamese writing because, you know, they have little um, accents above things. And the band came in and said, what's that? I said, what's what? And they said, that. I said, oh, that's the background. And they said, well, what does it mean? I said, what do you mean? You, what do you mean? You're called Saigon King. You can work that one out. And they said, what? We were Americans. I said, yeah, yeah. And don't forget, you lot, you know, stormed into Vietnam and killed lots of them. So, can you know what it is? What do you mean? You don't know about it. And you call yourself Saigon Kick. And they got <laughs> really upset. The fuck with And he said, um... Well, you know, oh, we're not we're, we're anti-war. I said, well, if you read those, you'd know what it is. And I think I went through the <laughs> must have been pissed. Uh, <laughs> I think I threw the phrase book. Said, yeah, you go sort it out, kid. Anyway, they had no sense of humour. Typically, fucking Americans. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> and the bloke said, oh, I'm not doing that. I'm not prepared to do that. So I just went up to the background, and Ray Palmer was meant to be in the photo shoot after me for Kerrang. So I just said, here you go. And I've got, the, you know, those big nine-foot paper rolls. We've got it. So I've written these letters in massive great. I said, you're not even going to read it, lad. 
oh, I bet you're saying something. And I said, oh, it doesn't matter. Anyway, you're in Texas. I said, let me do a Polaroid and I'll show you. But the, obviously, this bloke had taken it, you know, what was it, you know, he really didn't take to me. So I then went, okay, don't worry about it. And I ripped this whole nine-foot piece of paper down. <laughs> screwed it up on the floor and said, don't worry, let's carry on, let's shoot there. And the bloke said, I'm not going to work with you. I said, that's all right, well, I'll try and go off the others, shouldn't I? Come on, boys. And they were like, not sure what going on. And then I saw the look on Ray's face, like, you're going to fuck my shoot up. And then I think the press officer <laughs> sort of got a bit funny and said, oh, fuck you then, I'm going down the pub again. <laughs> so here you go, that context, backfiring. I can tell you about that one, but I can't tell you about Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> no, no worries, man, no worries. So that'd be a good little edit if you could get that one together. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll do my best. Um, I've got another one. Um, I've got another one here. It says, "Can you ever switch off from photography, or are you figuratively always looking life um, through a lens?" And were there any fucking real di- fuck- were, were there any real divas or awkward people in metal that um, you didn't enjoy working with? I was going to say what a good question, except it was a bit too fucking long. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, um, weirdly. This is what I mean. I think I think I'm, I am a photographer, and I think real photographers are photographers who are people who make things with light. I do see pictures, and if you ever do look at my Facebook, I do take I do quite take quite a lot of photos. Mate, um, on my can, I just, iPhone. can I just stop you there? I'm on your Facebook, and I have okay. seen. Oh, sorry, Instagram. I mean, Instagram, uh, right. Well, I'm yeah. on, well, I'm on your Facebook, and I've seen a picture of somebody that I haven't seen for over 30 years, um, <laughs> who was involved in managing Acid Rain. He was a tour manager of ours. And, um, yeah, um, Al Simpson. Oh, do you know he died? I, well, I do now. Uh, sorry, yeah. Um, he died a few years ago. Um, I do believe he had some uh, mental health problems. And um, what was really, really disgusting when he did die... Um, I, it really upset me because I worked. I didn't know he actually managed you. Um, he was very close friends with the band Crow Molly. Do you remember them? Yes. Well, Steve, vocalist, lives in I think Market Harbour, which is not far from Daventry, from where I live. Um, and we both were shocked by you know this hearing that Alan had passed away. Yeah. And uh, both him. In fact, Steve drove me down. We drove down together. Steve has got quite a successful um, uh, graphics graphic arts company, and I think he was involved with doing the chosen album cover as well. So, just the fact that it's a very small world, but we were yeah. disgusted that I think it was only Steve and myself who were there from the music industry at his funeral. Well, uh, it's funny you should say that because I went to Martin Hooker's uh, memorial just before Christmas, um, and I, I was I was the only I was the only person from a band there. So I say I'd love to be able to go to. to sounds all right. I want to go to more funerals, but um, did you know Kelvin Hellraiser? I did. Yeah, and I only found out about him the other day. Yeah, well, I want to go to his funeral uh, if I can. So, did you? Um, here, how? What, Kelv? Yeah. No, not at all. Well, the thing is, nobody's going to know until his parents do announce. So it was that it was that terrible. I, I will tell you, this doesn't go any further, yeah? Uh, right, OK. Bear with me one second. I'm just going to pause the recording. Hang on. Thank you, Sam. And I recently were, I started working with another company called... Rock Photographers Collective. Right, okay, okay. yeah. And those will be very interesting links. Yeah, I've, I've been on the Rock Photographers Collective, and, right. I, and that's really cool, I like that. Well, the, that's the sort of thing that, what I would like to do, uh, it was somebody else's kind of concept, I, I think it was sort of kind of came together through discussion, and what we want to do is almost try and make it as an agency, and as you, it is about older stuff. But what we would love to do is to be there to discuss with new, younger photographers about pitfalls. Because like I say, some of those questions were really, really intelligent. And I would love you to say at the end of this, 
if anybody has more questions like that, I would really love to maybe do a, a whole piece just on questions. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. You know what I mean? Because yeah. if we can give advice, because like I say, I really look forward to seeing the next generations of musicians, artists, photographers. In some senses, it's easier because you have the internet and Cubase or Base or whatever you can do at home, and you've got phones that take photos in pitch black. But, I think people still must also look at the past and study the history of whether it's the music, whether it's of metal music, whether it's rock music, whether it's photography or whatever. Don't think nowadays, you know, it's one of those sort of things. Don't think just because you can, it's there. So please make sure you're doing it for a proper reason. You know what I mean? Yeah. Not just to get in and meet the band. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Do your work, you know, make it, it's art, all of it's art, music's art, talking's art, poetry, journalism, you know. Oh, dear. Mm, trust, trust me, darling. <laughs> well, basically, if, you, if, you, if you're struggling to get paid, it's art. Oh, yes. Oh, fuck me. It's become a real art nowadays, isn't it? <laughs> oh, absolutely, mate. All anyway, right, look, I'll chop quick, all this up. Quick, I'll, I'll, yeah, ca- I'll chop all this up and I'll catch you next time. Yeah, quick one. What's this about you doing comedy? Yeah, I've been doing it for 25 years, mate. Really? And what do yeah. you, how do you go out as? Um, I go out as a as a character called Keith Platt, professional Yorkshireman. Oh, fucking brilliant! Send me a link, please. I will. Have do. you ever done any? Have you ever done anything in Bristol? Uh, oh God, yeah, yeah. I've played Bristol a few times. Was, um, what's, because what, what's what, the big what, nightclub the, there? I played the big I nightclub last year. I don't know. But because the, one of the blokes is involved with Rock Photographers Collective is a guy, um, Dave who actually runs some comedy clubs. Oh, right, OK. Well, yeah, I mean, I've, you... I've, I've done the... Um, I'm just, I can't remember the name, but the main nightclub, no. the main nightclub in, uh, in Bristol used to have a comedy night before right. it sort of becomes a nightclub, an early show. And I did that quite right. a few times. I think that, that might be one of the blokes who might be involved with um, Rock Photographers Collective. So if, if you still owe money, let me know and I'll try and get it for you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks a lot, mate. Lovely talking to you, Howard. And, and you, uh, mate. Give us a shout soon. And, will uh, do. Let us know how it all comes together and when I can have a lift. And... Yeah, I will do, and um, and we'll um, we'll we'll do a, we'll do a a piece of all questions as well. Maybe yeah, if it can help, that'd be great. And uh, love to anyone you know that we know. And um, yeah, so. uh, so I look forward to hearing people. And I'm not I'm not as expensive as the fucking website looks. <laughs> <laughs> all right, mate. Take care. Take care. Lovely talking, Howard. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And that was my chat with the life force that is Tony Mottram. That is the sound of somebody not giving a shit. Um, love him. Absolutely love him. Top bloke. Uh, incredible, incredible photographer. Do check out all of um, uh, his websites and everything. And uh, um, it, it's it's got to be done. It's like traveling back in time and you will see some pictures from back in your youth and go, wow, or even maybe not even that far back and go, wow, I didn't realize it was him. Um, now, there is there is a trend amongst podcasts and I really, really, this has been annoying me because I'm down a lot, downloading a lot of podcasts, listening to a lot of podcasts. Uh, not not competitive research, more just because fucking time on my hands. Anyway, I have noticed that there is a real, real issue um, with some podcasts, two in particular I'm thinking of. No point in mentioning them because they're like neither here nor there. But And this seems to be when there's two people as well. They do the interview and then the two of them sit there and discuss how great the interview was, how much fun it was, um, and 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 almost they just sit there and just talk about the interview. I've just fucking listened to it. Oh yeah, by the way, I'm back. Um, I've just fucking listened to it. I've, I, I mean, I have literally just listened to the interview, and you are now going to sit there and be self-reverential about your own interview and go through it all again and discuss it. And go on about how happy you are and how amazing you think it is. And I and okay, I do a bit of that. I'm hands up, you gotta really. There's no point in completely ignoring it as soon as as soon as the interview's finished. By the same token, right? I'd still be going on about it now. And it's and like I say, it does seem to be a symptom a symptom of two people. 
and when they're really pleased with it it's it's almost like that that they can't contain themselves and then they, they, and and i guess this is where you can tell a professional podcast from, a, from a, um, a, an amateur podcast because a professional podcast somebody will move in be it a director or a producer and say right okay stop now because you're just going on and on about you and what you've done and how great what you've done is and everybody's just fucking listen to it so give it a rest that's kind of what you know director pub, whatever would do jesus i know i know you're listening to this and you're thinking fucking hell howard you really should have one of those because your internal edit is broken it is indeed i couldn't agree more we have an accord um so uh there you go that was the interview with tony Mottram. um you've already had movie bollocks with philip jackson this month and you will be getting a podcast at the end of the month listen to all of this great content um if you want to sign up at patreon or hey if you just want to uh, just bung me a contribution via paypal that's absolutely fine as well absolutely fine you want to support the show in any way um the email address is how one ard that's h-o-w then the digit one a-r-d how one ard at hotmail.com um and if you ping me uh if you ping the the show a um a donation i'll give you a shout out on the show but i hadn't planned any of this by the way this is just off the top of my fucking head um uh i'll I, yeah I'll, I'll obviously you know, shout outs glow and all the rest of it but if you want to sign up at patreon do the same thing um uh or like i said if you just want to paypal me some money so i can pay for some food that'd be great <laughs> I, I think seriously things are not that bad they're not um but uh, look i i appreciate all of you listening and i do appreciate that you are fucking all struggling and suffering to various extents so i don't mean to um you know i i, I don't mean to say that my uh, situation is any worse or any better than anyone else's or that I'm more important than anyone else or anything I just happen to have a podcast and I wanted to talk to somebody and I'm afraid it ended up being you so sorry about that um one thing I would like you to do if you're listening to this at work okay and I don't mean working from home if you are at work if you are in an office of any kind I want you to do me a favor okay and I want you to do it while we're doing this now because there's a lot of things that I've asked you to do in the past about the podcast that we can't do anymore like shout bollocks and bollocks back at a gig no gigs can't do it so what I'd like you to do is if you are at work right now okay right now whatever you're doing if you're on a PC you're on a laptop whatever okay whatever you're doing you're listening to this on headphones because you clearly you're not broadcasting this around this around the office and if you are you're all cunts i hate working with you you know it's got to be done hasn't it so what we need to do is open an email not a personal email i want you to open an, a business email from your business account from where you're working right open that email up now and in the address box type howard at allabouttherock.co.uk okay and just send me an email and in the subject write work okay just put work and i want to see how many emails i get from people who are actually at work right now i realize that i may end up getting emails like you know for the rest of the year like years to come can you imagine i'm like i, I turned 50 this year can you imagine like a decade down down the line right celebrating my 60th still get still getting like emails from people that just says work in the subject for the rest of my fucking life as people listen to this on youtube or whatever on podcast players and feel free to do that by the way because that will make me chuckle and be a constant reminder that i shouldn't do fucking stupid shit like this so anyway wherever you are if you're in the bath in the shower you're on your balcony you're on your roof you're in a garden you're in the woods you're with your husband you're with your wife you're with your boyfriend you're with your girlfriend you're with your non-gender um binary individual you're with your genderless uh, lump of flesh you are uh, running a marathon you are delivering milk you're on your way to the airport to go on holiday you are just waking up and listening to this for the first thing whatever you're doing wherever you are you are the best way of spreading the word for this podcast so please do because that would really help you can sign up at patreon patreon.com forward slash howard h smith um we have podcasts at uh, bolo casts nay bolo casts coming out of your ears over the net well coming out of my mouth into your ears 
continually going to keep this up and got some really cool and exciting stuff for you. Um, not as exciting as the guests that haven't happened. Now, you'd be hearing all about that and all the gossip behind the scenes. If you're a patron, feel free to sign up. Anyway, sorry about that. Don't mean to go on, but it is rather important in my life at the moment. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you very much. Thanks for listening. Absolute pleasure. Keep supporting the show. And I'll speak to you again at the end of the month. And can't leave it like that. Just wanted to say thank you very much for listening. If you fast forwarded past my bullshit, absolutely fine. Not a problem. Not for everybody. Um, but in all, you know, in all seriousness, thanks for listening, as always. And I will speak to you next month.